Thank you. Uh, wonderful. Let's move on to our first scientific session. So our first scientific session is on neuromodulation of pain. And we have three faculty from the University of Minnesota, which are the uh, chairs of the session, Lucy Volchanova, George Wilcox, and Carolyn Fair Fairbanks. So um, I think Lucy will give sort of the five minute intro to the session. That's correct. And Carolyn will not be able to attend. She's okay. otherwise occupied right now. She, she will be tonight. She's running in the movie and the discussion tonight. So we'll right. see Carolyn. Thanks, George. Hey, hi, everyone. Uh, is my screen sharing working? Yes, right now? You're, you're good. Um, I first would like to uh, welcome everyone to the first session of the first scientific session of the uh, 2021 uh, Minnesota Neuromodulation Sympo Symposium, which is dedicated to neuromodulation for pain treatment. Um, I just want to talk quickly about the magnitude of the problem, which is persistent pain. Uh, this was reviewed very comprehensively in a 2011 uh, report, Relieving uh, Pain in America. And uh, really the, the bottom line that I would like to highlight is that um, based on this report, um, chronic pain affects approximately 100 million adults in the US and costs approximately $50 billion uh, dollars in uh, lost productivity. Uh, but importantly, roughly 60% of chronic pain patients um, are dissatisfied with their treatment. Their, their pain is not managed um, adequately. Um, and in addition, we have a very limited arsenal of pharmacological treatments that are often ineffective and they have severe side effects, including the risks for addiction, uh, which has contributed to the opioid misuse crisis that's spiking our society uh, currently. Um, due to these challenges uh, in treatment, there have been increased efforts for development and use of alternative tr treatment approaches, such as neuromodulation for electrical stimulation, uh, by electrical stimulation of components of the nociceptive system. And um, um, currently there is even recommendations to um, for, for patients in, in whom um, pharmacological treatments are non-opioid pharmacological treatments are ineffective to move to neuromodulation before using um, opioid therapies. Uh, current neuromodulation strategies for pain treatment target the somatosensory processing in the spinal cord. Um, this is a quick overview of, of this system uh, from a, a classic illustration. I will switch to my pointer here. Um, so sensory inputs uh, are detected by sensory receptors in the periphery, uh, including um, receptors in the skin that include nociceptors and uh, mechanoreceptors for uh, touch and uh, pressure and other mechanical stimuli, innocuous mechanical stimuli. The cell bodies of these receptors are localized in dorsal root ganglia and it's their peripheral processes that extend um, to the periphery and, and detect stimuli, whereas their central processes um, provide input into the spinal cord. Inputs from um, nociceptors are carried uh, through um, high threshold, which means uh, high threshold for stimulation, um, unmyelinated or lightly unmyelinated fibers whereas innocuous mechanical stimulation um, uh, are input, uh, innocuous mechanical stimulation inputs are provided by A beta fibers, <coughs> uh, which uh, require lower thresholds of stimulation as well as some other fibers. Within the spinal cord, these um, inputs activate complex uh, circuits of interneurons as well as projection neurons 
that send information to um, supraspinal levels. Uh, these interneurons um, process the information in complex circuits and are able to modulate the activity of the projection neurons and therefore modulate um, the transmission of uh, pain signals to supraspinal sites. Um, decades before the complexity of um, circuitry in the dorsal horn of spinal cord uh, was known, um, Malzak and Wall uh, formulated the gate control theory of pain, which uh, generally states that the balance of nociceptive and non-nociceptive inputs to the dorsal horn regulates the activity of projection neurons. Um, and soon after this uh, theory was formulated, uh, the first clinical studies on electrical stimulation of peripheral nerves, as well as uh, of the spinal cord uh, began in the 60s. Currently, neuromodulation strategies for pain treatment target uh, peripheral nerves, dorsal root ganglia, as well as spinal cord. And this spectrum is represented by um, the talks that I will hear today. And these talks also uh, span the continuum of basic translational and clinical research, as well as the development of new devices. And now I will pass the mic to the co-chair Dr. George Wilcox to introduce our first speaker. Thank you, Lucy. That was a great, uh, great summary. And um, it is my great honor to introduce uh, Professor Kathleen Sluka, who's a good friend of mine, Professor of Physical Therapy and Rehabilitation Science, Pharmacology and Neuroscience at the University of Iowa. Professor Sluka is the leading international authority on the use of transcutaneous electric nerve stimulation for the treatment of pain, as well as a, a pioneer in determining mechanisms underlying chronic pain arising from joint and muscle inflammation. She has contributed extensive leadership internationally to development of clinical practice standards and guidelines to mentoring early career scholars at stages of training and various stages of uh, training and career development and has been recognized with numerous prestigious awards from the Distinguished Service Award and the Frederick Kerr Basic Science Research Awards from the American Pain Society, the Kate Daum Research Professorship from the University of Iowa, and most recently the 2021 Discovery and Innovation Scholar of the Year Award from the University of Iowa's Office of the Vice President for Research. So I'd like to welcome Kathleen and thank uh, her very, very much for taking the time to join us for this uh, 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 session. Kathleen. Thank you, George. Nice to be here. Um, Good to see you. I'm going to talk to you today about a form of neuromodulation that is often overlooked and underutilized. And I say that because it's cheap and it's safe and it probably should be a first treatment before we get to a lot of other treatments. Um, and that's transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation. And I've been studying this for a long time. Prior to studying it, I actually used it in the clinic with patients to help them manage their pain. And while it's not a cure for pain, it's a method to help manage pain. To, and I'm hopefully gonna show you by the end of this, the best way to use it and why we should be using it more frequently than we do. So we're gonna start with some studies where we talk about the basic mechanisms of pain. Let's see, but before I get there, I have to acknowledge that this has been a team effort over the last 20 or 25 years from my lab for when it couldn't have been done without multiple grants and multiple people who really drove these projects forward. And I just get to be the person who stands up here and tells you about it or sits here. So our goals are to understand the mechanisms of TENS analgesia, the clinical letter, literature for TENS effectiveness, and then understand how to apply it clinically. So transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation is really the application of electrical current 
through the skin for pain relief. And you can modulate a lot of different parameters. You can modulate the frequency of stimulation, the waveforms, the amplitude and the duration. And it turns out that nobody knew what we were how to use it when we first started these studies. We kind of just put it on and we tried whatever seemed to work. And as Lucy said, this, this actually started back in the 1960s. It was brought by Wall and Sweet in 1967, published in Science, as a, meth as a pre screening tool for putting in spinal cord stimulators. And then they found it was effective. So our studies over a series of time, I'm just gonna kind of show you some highlights of what we've done. And uh, we'll start with the mechanisms. So the first thing we really had to do was figure out whether or not this was gonna work in an animal model. And so the first series of students um, that did this project were physical therapy students that were working in my laboratory and wanted to apply and see if tents worked in an animal model, model of arthritis. So we applied TENS to knee joints that were inflamed and measured their response to noxious stimuli, or we call this hyperalgesia, and these are their pain behaviors. So at baseline, and you guys can see my arrow, right? So at yes, baseline, can. you can yes, see, ba good. <laughs> You can see this is the basal latency, and this is a stimulation to heat. The same thing happens whether we use mechanical or heat stimulation. After we injure the animals, that goes down, and that's a pain behavior that we do. And then we did a sham control or a low frequency stimulation or a high frequency stimulation. And so the frequencies were either 100 hertz or 4 hertz stimulation. And we're going to routinely talk about these two stimulation frequencies, and they're the most commonly utilized clinically. But you can see that after a single treatment, we got a long lasting effect on the hyperalgesia and we were able to fully reverse it. So using this model, we then looked at what happens to the neurons in the central nervous system. So neurons in the central nervous system in the spinal cord dorsal horn respond to nociceptive stimuli. There's a couple different types um, in the dorsal horn and that doesn't matter so much right now. But what happens is after inflammation, these neurons become more excitable to noxious stimuli. So the red is before the injury, the green is after the injury. And you can see that after stimulation and either low or high frequency tense does the same thing, we get a reduction in that sensitized response of the neuron. So we're able to reduce central neuron excitability. We also tested how TENS, whoops, um, so I'm gonna skip that one. Um, so we also wanted to know what happens to TENS is it, uh, and how is it producing this analgesia. So the classic inhibitory pathways in the, spot in the brain include input from the periaqueductal gray, sense input through the brainstem in this area called the rostral ventral medial medulla, sense input to the spinal cord, and they all utilize opioids to produce analgesia. So we asked the question of whether or not this pathway was activated and whether or not opioids were mediating that response. So the first experiment we did is we went into the uh, periaqueductal gray or the PAG, and we put cannula in here and we blocked neuron activity using cobalt chloride during either a low frequency stimulation or a high frequency stimulation. And what we're showing you here is anything that shows close to 100, 100 is a full reversal of hyperalgesia. And so under normal conditions, this is how much analgesia you get with either a low or a high frequency tense. If we block the activity in the ventrolateral PAG, that analgesia doesn't occur. So that just shows that this nucleus is involved in the process. We then went to the RVM and we asked whether or not opioid receptors were involved in that process. And we blocked um, new opioid receptors with a low dose of naloxone or delta opioid receptors with naltrinidol. And what we showed was a frequency dependent effect where low frequency TENS was blocked by 
blocking mu opioid receptors, and high frequency TENS was blocked when we blocked delta opioid receptors. And at the spinal cord level, we saw the exact same pattern where low frequency TENS uses mu and high frequency TENS uses delta opioid receptors. So this is suggesting that different frequencies have different mechanisms of action. These opioid effects were confirmed in human subjects in a group, uh, Serge Marchian group uh, did this in um, Quebec. And what he, the early studies actually showed that low frequency TENS was, me, was mediated by opioid receptors, but everybody always thought that high frequency TENS was non-opioid. But the doses you usually give to people um, when you do those studies are mu opioid selective doses of naloxone. So Serge Marchand's group actually gave a higher dose of naloxone and was able to block the effects of high frequency TENS analgesia. So this is the analgesia, this is the high dose. And so they just confirmed what we had seen in animals in human studies. We've looked at a number of other pathways and I'm uh, not gonna give you all of them, but it, but it is a very complicated neuropharmacological pathway, lots of pharmacology going on. We're using GABA, acetylcholine, and serotonin, to, as well as the opioids to produce the analgesia. But if you look at the clinical literature, it's really mixed. And there's a lot of reasons we think it's really mixed. Some of them say it works, some people say it doesn't. And I'll highlight a couple of things here. This Cochrane review I was a part of uh, that was published in 2015, most recently, and it was on acute pain. And what we did is we went in and we said, did they use the right parameters of stimulation? And that was part of the inclusion criteria. Most of these other systematic reviews do not use and look at, did they use the right dose? So dosing is super important. And so my conclusions on looking at all of these is that we really have a lot of not so great studies with a high risk of bias. There's huge heterogeneity among the studies. Many of them are using numbers of 10, 15 people per group. So they're quite low, for, particularly for a randomized controlled trial. Most of them are using inadequate dosing or don't actually provide the parameters of the stimulation. And then um, they may actually give the TENS unit and come back two weeks later and say, oh, did it work? Well, that's like giving morphine and say, coming back to somebody two weeks later and say, is it working? Or even the spinal cord stimulation that we heard from our patients today who were using them, um, that they know that when they turn it off, it stops working. So these are a number of factors that need to be considered when you're thinking about um, TENS outcome. One of the most important ones is dosing, but the timing of the outcome measure we talked about. It is opioid mediated, so you need to be thinking about repeated use and tolerance and maybe cross tolerance to uh, people who are using opioids. The patient population probably matters. Um, given that we know how it works, we should maybe target the treatment to the patient population with those deficits. And then what are you measuring as an outcome? It may not work well for every outcome, but it might work for some outcomes better than others. So I'll show you a couple of highlights from some work we did um, looking at tense dosing. So in a study um, that we did, uh, we looked at three different intensities of stimulation. And I'm gonna tell you that I think the most important dose that you can give to make TENS effective is the intensity of the stimulation. So if you give a low intensity of stimulation and compare that to the highest intensity of stimulation a person can tolerate that's not painful, you can see that the amount of analgesia is much greater with the higher level of stimulation. In this systematic rev review done by Jan Bajordel, he showed similar things for people with post-operative pain and their outcome was analgesic consumption. And if you divide the studies into those who had adequate dosing, high enough intensities, and those who did not, you can see there's a greater reduction in analgesic consumption compared to those who didn't. 
And so this just goes to show you that you have to consider all these factors when using the stimulation and also when evaluating the literature that exists. So in an animal study, we asked, because this is opioid mediated, what happens if you give TENS every day for, and in this case, they did six days of, of stimulation, what happens to the analgesic effect? So this is baseline. Before you stimulate with TENS, there's the hyperalgesic effect. You're getting a decrease in threshold. You give TENS, it's reversed, come back the next day, it's down, reverses, reverses. And you can see by day four, we're losing that analgesic effect. And we showed that this is related to cross tolerance for low frequency at mu opioid receptors in the spinal cord and cross tolerance um, at delta opioid receptors for high frequency TENS. So again, supporting the same mechanisms and that is opioid mediated um, tolerance. We did a similar study in human subjects where we gave them TENS repeatedly for several days. And by the fifth day, both low and high frequency TENS are also ineffective. But you can alleviate that tolerance effect by just combining low and high frequency TENS. So out there in the pharmacological literature, there's data that says if you combine a mu and a delta opioid receptor, uh, agonists together, you prevent development of opioid tolerance. And indeed, we saw this when we mixed the frequencies and gave low and high frequency TENS together in each session. So if it's opioid mediated and you're tolerant to opioid, you might expect that low frequency TENS wouldn't work. So we took animals and we made them op opioid tolerant. And when they were tolerant to morphine, low frequency TENS didn't work and high frequency TENS still did. And that same effect was shown by Serge Marchand's group again in human subjects being given TENS, where you're still getting analgesia with high frequency TENS in individuals who are opioid tolerant. But in those who are opioid tolerant, low frequency TENS didn't work. So again, confirming the animal data. So given all of that, we decided what we wanted to do was take all this data we'd learned and do a clinical trial and address all the concerns of the previous clinical trial. So we did this trial called the Fibromyalgia Activity Study in TENS, or the FAST study which was funded by the National Institutes of Health. And we decided we were gonna use a condition, um, fibromyalgia, which has a loss of inhibition and less serotonin and opioid um, analgesia and increased facilitation in the central nervous system. And we use that condition because TENS increases central inhibition through opioids and serotonin and TENS, um, decreases central facilitation. So the trial applied TENS units to our uh, TENS to the upper and the lower back. We did a randomized controlled trial design with three groups, the active group, the placebo group, and the no TENS group. And note, we had a, nearly 100 subjects per group. So there were 301 subjects in the study. We gave an alternating frequency, so we'd eliminate uh, tolerance. Subjects used the TENS unit at home. And we actually looked at our primary outcome of movement evoked pain because one of our preliminary studies seemed to show better effects on movement pain than resting pain. And we measured the outcome while the TENS unit was on when the greatest effects were expected to occur since it was a pharmacological mechanism of action. So these are the main results of the study. Um, and in the top panel, I'm showing you pain. In the bottom, I'm showing you fatigue. And they essentially show the same thing. So this is our baseline. And people had baseline ratings of six, six and a half. After our initial treatment of TENS, which was a 30-minute treatment, you can see a, a, a small reduction in their pain scores compared to the no TENS condition or the placebo condition. Patients then took that home used it for a month when they were physically active. And then we did that 
again, and we show a nearly two point reduction in pain with movement. And this is pain with movement during a walking task or a sit and stand task. We also show a nice reduction in resting pain. And unique to this is we show similarly a reduction in fatigue. And there aren't very many treatments for people with, uh, for fatigue out there. And so this was a really nice added benefit um, to the study that we were getting uh, reductions in fatigue. As part of the study, we collected all the adverse events. Um, and I will tell you that, uh, so, we, so we were able to calculate both number needed to treat and number needed to harm. And these are commonly used in pharmaceutical studies, but not commonly reported in non-drug trials. So the number needed to treat for pain and fatigue was between a three and a five, which is really quite low um, and, and comparable to pharmaceutical treatments. But the number needed to harm was non-existent for serious adverse events. N nobody had a serious adverse event out of 301 individuals. For the number needed to harm, there were some minor, minor things that came up. Um, some people got some itchiness. Some people had a little anxiety with the TENS. Um, some people reported an increased pain with TENS, uh, a little nausea or some skin irritation around the electrodes. But you can see our number needed to harms are somewhere between 20 and 100. And this is substantially higher than a pharmaceutical trials, which usually range within the eight to 10 range. So this suggests that TENS is safe and effective. We also looked at what were, who were the responders. Now it turns out, of course, like any treatment, not everybody responds to the treatment. And we chose a 30% reduction in pain as a clinically meaningful reduction in pain. And 44% of our population showed a significant, clinically significant reduction in pain. And we asked what were the predictors of success in that treatment. And it turns out there were two predictors, the initial response to TENS treatment. So the, whatever they got on the first day, if they got a 10% reduction on the first time, they, first day, they were something like 82% likely to get a 30% reduction after a month. And those with higher widespread pain had greater responses. So that shows that you can maybe select who will respond by just doing an initial trial, which is something very similar to what is done in spinal cord stimulation individuals. So these are the recommendations based on all our research for, for what we would do with TENS. You, can mod, you should modulate it between low and high frequency, should be as high as the patient can tolerate it, yet not painful. We suggest a minimum of 30 minutes and to do it when they're physically active or during exercise. Greatest amount of analgesia occurs when you give it at the site of the pain, which can be difficult for people with widespread pain, which is why we gave it to uh, the spinal region, which encompasses a lot, can encompass the whole dermatomal area. Uh, patient population that it might respond best to are those with central mechanisms underlying their pain. And those are just the contraindications. So given that we know it's effective, we decided we wanted to try and see if we could implement it into clinical practice. And the first study we did, it, we call it the best study, um, which is really cool to be able to stand up and tell people we're talking about the best study. Um, and it was an impl implementation study trying to get it into primary care practice at the University of Iowa Hospitals and Clinics. So in order to do this, we developed a smart set in EPIC where first line treatments were non-drug treatments and the pharmacological first line treatments were things like NSAIDs and acetaminophen or referral to say physical therapy or psycholo psychology. Um, and, and you'll note that opioids are not on our first, second, our third line treatments. So our goal was to get the primary care doctors to pick the non-drug treatments as their first line of treatment. And so we developed an order for TENS, 
We also did one for exercise, and I'm just going to show you the 10 data. Um, and so all they had to do was click this button here, and it would automatically uh, be prescribed with all of the prescription details of what was effective. And they got an order. And then they got an order for tens that was sent directly to the pharmacy. And the pharmacy stocked the tens units. We got them stocked there, and were educated in how to um, talk to the patients about the use of tens. We developed a video. We developed uh, our own usage uh, data for the tents, and that was sent home with the patient with the, the links or a written documentation. And it had all you could possibly want to know about how tents works and how to use it. We posted them on the University of Iowa website, and they're still there, and they're still being used today. This is what the order would look like. It talks about the device. It tells you what program to use on the device that we chose, and it tells you how to use it and how long. We did a number of implementation strategies, and uh, I'm gonna tell you that changing primary care practice is difficult really, really hard. So we did a lot of training sessions. We did a lot of feedback sessions. We did audit and feedback and showed them how they were doing. Um, we put somebody in the clinic. We had one-on-one -on -one meetings with providers. And of course, one of our implementation strategies was sticking it in the pharmacy and training the pharmacists. So there was a whole series of things we did to try and improve uptake. And this is what our data looks like. So this is quality care data that you get out of the hospital EPIC system. Um, what you see in the first set of these bars is this is from two of the clinics that we did, that the usage was really quite low. And we were only looking at increasing usage in those with chronic musculoskeletal pain on a first visit, um, uh, on an episode. And so we were expecting to see an increase in this before we implemented all this, there was kind of an old outdated kind of TENS prescription in there. So we were able to see that that was used about 4% of the time. And we got an increase to about uh, 10 to 15% of the population of the orders were orders for TENS. Now TENS is only ordered once. And so this was all encounters. It didn't include just initial visits it included when somebody would come back for their six week check as well. So somebody would probably only get an order for tens once. Whereas if you could do an opioid, you might get that order every week or every two weeks or an NSAID, you might get it at every visit. So keeping that in mind, we were pretty pleased with this uptick in um, use of tens. So given all that, and, and the difficulty with that, we also know that in physical therapy practice, and these are the people who are trained in the use of TENS, it's also not being used well. Most physical therapists consider it a passive treatment and that they won't want their patients to do passive treatments. They just want them to be active. Um, and so we have uh, started a new study trying to implement TENS into physical therapy practice. And we call this the FM TIP study, Fibromyalgia Tense and Physical Therapy Study. It was funded as part of the HEAL initiative um, and it's a, a pragmatic clinical trial. Um, and it was funded through the uh, National Institutes of Health. Uh, what we're doing is we're going to private physical therapy clinics across the states of uh, Illinois, Iowa, Wisconsin, and Michigan. Um, and we have 24 clinics. We're going to enroll 600 people with fibromyalgia. Um, what's cool about a pragmatic trial is there's really no exclusion criteria except for those who are unstable medically or those who might have a contraindication to the intervention. So every, everybody gets in the trial if they want to participate. We're putting it into routine physical therapy care. We don't tell them what that is. They just get it with or without TENS and they just have to have a diagnosis of fibromyalgia, but it doesn't have to be their, prim their primary reason for coming to physical therapy. Definitely. And our Can goal- 
I'm, I'm yeah. very sorry to interrupt, but it's a half an hour talk. Okay. I'm on the end. Good. So uh, you're you're good. Sorry about that. Um, so anyways, this, this is what we're going to do. We're going to look at movement evoked pain, adherence to physical therapy, and their functional goals. This is the study team. It's a big team, um, including lots of healthcare systems, the clinical trials, and data management system, Vanderbilt University with Leslie Crawford and her team, and, and our team at Iowa. And with that, um, I will end and talk about the clinic and just really want to say that clinically, the use of TENS can help people move with less pain, help them engage. Our, our goal is to help them engage in more activity um, and get them more functional. And so we think that TENS could be an initial first line treatment for individuals with pain due to its safety, its efficacy, and its lack of expense to the patient. Well, thank you very much, you. Kathleen, for a, a TENS tour de force. Um, it was really uh, highly informative. And, and I think as a, I, I, has, I have always been a believer in TENS, and I think you just convinced me a little bit more. That we have one question, which maybe you could address. Have there been any long-term studies longer than 30 days, say? Um, and if so, ha, ha, how does the tolerance change over time, over like a month? So there have been a few studies that have gone out longer. The thing with TENS, are, in fact, the study that we did actually went to two months and we showed equal efficacy out okay. at two months that it continued to work. But again, we were using a mixed frequency and I think that's a different, different, a di whole different ball game than, than a single uh, frequency of stimulation. There's been delta, few, it's the only way to go. Yep. There's, a, there's few studies that have looked long-term um, and mainly because it isn't a long-term cure, it's a long-term usage much like spinal cord stimulation is to help people move and get back and more functional. Um, so, yep, mixed frequency, I think, is the way to go. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Kathleen. And I think now we can move on to our second presentation. And it's my pl uh, privilege to introduce to you a video contributed by Dr. Kip Ludwig who's an associate professor of biomedical engineering and adjunct faculty member of neurological surgery at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where he leads the bioelectronic medicine laboratory. Their focus is the development of next generation neuromodulation therapies to treat circuit dysfunction and deliver biomolecules to target therapeutic areas. Before his academic appointment, Dr. Ludwig served as program director for neural engineering at the NIH. He co-led the translational devices program at NINDS, led the NIH brain initiative programs to catalyze implantable academic and clinical devices to stimulate and or record from the central nervous system, and led a trans-NIH planning team in developing the $250 million SPARC program, S-P-A-R-C, to uh, stimul stimulate advances in neuromodulation therapies for organ systems. Dr. Ludwig was disappointed that he could, could not join us today in person. Kip is actually planned. here. He has a video, but he will. He, he, he has a video, but he will be here to entertain questions at the end. Right. Um, and uh, the, uh, it is entitled The Inject Trode, Changing the Business Case for Spinal Cord Stimulation to Treat Pain. Hi everyone, my name is Kip Ludwig. I'm the co-director for the Wisconsin Institute for Translational Neural Engineering, which is found in Madison, Wisconsin, which is on your screen right now. It's actually set between uh, two lakes and it's beautiful this time of year. I'm very happy to be at the Minnesota Neuromodulation Symposium. I've been to eight of them, I think at this point. Um, and Minnesota really is the Silicon Valley for neuromodulation with so many industry companies in the local area. Today we're going to talk to you a little bit about uh, the injectrode, which is something that we've been developing uh, to really take a different look at spinal cord stimulation for pain. 
these are my disclosures. Um, I do a lot of uh, consulting for companies that span from transcutaneous non-invasive stimulation to implantable invasive systems. I am also the co-founder of a company called Neurona, which has actually been spun out to commercialize the injectrode concept that we'll talk a little bit about today. This is the outline for my talk. I'm going to talk a little bit about non-invasive and invasive stimulation and really that they are fantastic for certain applications, but they both have different trade-offs. I'm then going to talk a little bit about the injectrode, which is really meant to be a go-between between, between um, non-invasive, inexpensive, non-invasive stimulation and invasive stimulation. Um, and then I'll talk about the data we have today to really uh, that supports some of the advantages we think the injectrode might have over either systems. It will also have its own disadvantages as well. Now, electrodes can span a, a number of concepts to stimulate deep nerves. You can attempt to stimulate them from the surface of the skin, such as a TENS unit that's often used for physical therapy. Uh, there are percutaneous leads that uh, have are connected to an outside stimulator that are often used uh, for trial stimulation and spinal cord stimulation for pain. There are wireless stimulators where there is a transmitter that actually transmits uh, energy and instructions to an implantable moat. Um, and then there are the traditional uh, wired implantable pulse generator invasive systems that you see on the right side of the screen. Now, transcutaneous stimulators, where there is a non-invasive electrode pair placed on the surface of the skin, can stimulate the deep nerves, including the spinal cord, but like a defibrillator of the heart, it typically has to stimulate just about everything in between to activate the fibers at this deep nerve. The other important point is that the fall off of an electric field is very steep. It's actually one over R squared, uh, where R is the distance from the electrode pair. So when you're using non-invasive stimulation, you really have to crank up the current to get something to go to the deep nerve. This is actually a study that we did in pig, where we're stimulating the vagus nerve, which creates a heart rate effect. And in the upper left-hand corner, we've placed the gamma core transcutaneous system, or a mimic of it, directly on the vagus nerve in an invasive surgical implant. And what you see is we get about a 20% drop in heart rate. The red period is where we're stimulating. Now, if we just transpose a little bit of fat in between with a little bit of skin, roughly two millimeters, uh, that's the middle figure, we get virtually no drop, uh, this is about 1%, for a little bit more voltage. And we actually have to crank it up to 11 volts to start getting a 5% drop. Now, the distance to the vagus in the human is two to four centimeters, not two millimeters. So you really have to crank it up to get these A delta and B fibers that are typically associated with the heart rate effect um, for the vagus nerve. And of course, this creates a problem. There's actually many nerves that are superficial to the muscle just under the skin. In the case of the electric core transcutaneous system, uh, there's the transverse cervical nerve that runs right under the skin under the electrode, and it actually activates the platysma muscle, which causes lip curl, which is a therapy letting side effect. So it's difficult to consistently engage the vagus without creating this intolerable side effect um, from activating these superficial nerves. So Seth Hayes at UTD had a great study where he did transcutaneous stimulation of the vagus in the rodent and looked for the activation of the herring brewer reflex, uh, which is uh, really a breathing rate change uh, from activating uh, A deltas in the vagus. And what he saw was he actually had to, in a rat, get to 34 milliamps to actually activate this reflex, which was about 15x higher than what it took to activate the superficial neck muscles. Um, now, this again, it is an rodent where you're not, you know, you're a millimeter or two away from the vagus as opposed to two to four centimeters. Now, implantable devices have their own series of trade-offs. They can give you much more specificity, although not perfect specificity, for stimulating a deep nerve or a nervous structure such as the dorsal root ganglia, um, but they're invasive. Uh, they also cost a lot more. They're much more complicated and have much more problems associated with them because of that. 
So what often isn't appreciated about implantable devices is they do have a significant complication rate. Uh, this is data from the follow pace study and then comparative data for vagus nerve stimulation, spinal cord stimulation, and DBS stimulation, where they showed that there was a 12.4% overall complication rate for the pacemaker in the first two months after implant. These are complicated devices with the pulse generator, there's multiple transition points that fail, um, and even at a year, um, after the first two months, there's an additional 9.2% complication rate. Um, these vary as a function of a spinal cord stimulator, which tends to have much more migration issues than the average uh, electrode for pacemakers. But the other major issue is the number of parts in an implantable device that's supposed to last 10 years. There are multiple suppliers. It's a very complicated supply chain, and errors crop up in the supply chain that can create uh, recalls over time as well. This isn't really appreciated in the literature, but it's worth pointing out that uh, the Centiva system for vagus nerve stimulation has had five recalls in, in recent years, including ones that are class one recalls, which is the most serious type of recall. Now there's been a lot of attention to this issue for spinal cord stimulators recently. This is actually a FDA guidance that was released in 2020 saying that people should conduct a trial a stimulation period before they implant the final pulse generator. And this is based off of data where they saw in a one year period, there are about 50,000 uh, spinal cord stimulators implanted annually. There's actually over a one year period, there was a reported 107,000 medical device reports related to spinal cord stimulation for pain. There were 500 associated with the patient death, 78,000 associated with the patient injury, and 29,000 associated with a clear device malfunction. It should be noted that the injuries and death may be related to the product. That's the exact wording the FDA guidance used, uh, but it's not definitive that they were related to this corresponding uh, device failure. But there have been instances where insulation fails near the pulse generator. It causes a surprise motor activation or a surprise pain while you're walking downstairs and you trip and death, fall down the stairs. So there are general rules of thumb when you have an implantable device, which has you know, thousands of resistors and capacitors, it has transition points uh, at multiple places, you have more failure points for a long-term implant than a simple device. Uh, you have a much more complicated supply chain. Both of these things dramatically increase the potential failure modes and risk, but also dramatically increase the cost of your device. Um, the other important thing is you're pretty much limited to the pulse generator that you have implanted at the time in terms of it requires another invasive surgery to fix or upgrade. Uh, this is really important for something like spinal cord stimulation for pain, where we're still learning how it works, whether or not it is an astrocyte response, whether or not we want to do high frequency block versus low frequency. As we learn, we need different pulse generators that do different things to allow us to optimize this effect. So we were interested in seeing if there was a third option that might be available here. In this particular case, we were inspired by lidocaine injections of nerves, where under ultrasound, a simple, very minimally invasive injection is placed on the nerve. Um, to some extent, we wanted to use surgical glues that had already been FDA approved and see if we could dope them with metal to make them conductive and create a system that would allow us to inject on a deep nerve an electrode. So that in 2019, we published our first paper on this concept, which used silver particles, which are toxic, but showed that we could create an injectable electrode that is uh, almost liquid in a syringe that forms in a sheath around a nerve and conforms to variable structures, and that this could be used to effectively activate a nerve as well as a standard clinical one. We have since been funded to apply this to injection onto the dorsal root ganglia um, to treat pain. Um, this is uh, funded by the NIH through the HEAL program with collaborators such as Doug Weber at Carnegie Mellon, Lee Fisher, uh, Andrew Shostell and Manfred Franke, who are also co-founders of Veronoff, Andrew Shostell being at Case Western, and Scott Lemka, who's one of the uh, really fantastic computational modelers of spinal cord stimulation for pain. So to some extent, what we've done is create a modification of the trial electrode procedure uh, with a couple of things that we think are very advantageous uh, for uh, stimulation of the, of the DRG. So the trial electrode procedure, essentially, you put in the lead, 
and then you have a percutaneous connector going to an external stimulator. So we've replaced this by injecting the injected material on the DRG, which kind of self-forms to the space in the foramen. We then inject a collector that's just under the surface of the skin with a injectrode extruded between the DRG injectrode and the collector under the surface of the skin. And instead of having a percutaneous wire, we actually stimulate with a TENS unit, non-invasively. It capacitively couples to the, the collector and sends the current to the DRG. In this way, the actual implanted pulse generator is outside the body, and the only thing that's placed in the body is a one-component system of the injector material. So we believe there are a number of potential advantages to this method, uh, and I'm going to talk about the data that we have right now to support each of these. So the first two advantages are that the injectrode is not a fixed size. It actually forms to the structure around it. And the nice thing is nerves tend to have sheaths that they run in. And so this is an example in a human cadaver of actually injecting in the carotid sheath onto the carotid sinus nerve. In the upper left, the mid is a, a breakout of it. And then this is actually ultrasound where the figure in one is the carotid sinus nerve. And you can see the injectrode is kind of right on top of it. The second is that the injectrode itself is flexible. Um, we can actually expand it. It's, it's only about 70 uh, kilopascals as opposed to 50 gig, uh, gigapascals for traditional metal electrodes. And it's expandable, yet still ma maintains its impedance. So on this slide, and this is great work by a, a postdoctoral fellow in my lab, James Trevathan, um, this is the electrochemical uh, impedance spectroscopy. And it's comparing directly the injectrode, which is this particle-based structure, uh, versus traditional electrodes of the same geometric size. And what we see is that the injectrode actually has a much lower impedance than these traditional electrode strategies. And that's because you actually get the surface area of the entirety of the bulk of the injectrode because fluid can penetrate to each particle or wire structure, as opposed to just being able to get to the surface, uh, which is the traditional electrode. So modeling work done by the Lemka lab also shows compared to the traditional um, really modified DBS lead in the bottom in C used to stimulate the DRG, um, which creates very local activation and a uh, non-uniform activation profile, the injectrode by injecting in the foramen and forming around the DRG to the size of the DRG actually gets more consistent activation of A betas, which what you'll see is comparing B to D, but also is able to activate A betas at a much lower charge density uh, than the traditional electro strategies. So in the pig model, we've shown that under fluoro, we can inject the injector on the DRG. In the upper left-hand corner is an injection of contrast, and you see that little U shape is actually forming around the DRG. And then we inject the injector. You can see a needle introducer that's actually injecting the material around the DRG. And then in the upper left-hand corner, you see us extruding back the wire injectrode to create a connection to a TENS unit or other thing that we want to stimulate. The nice thing about micro-CT is we can do a 3D reconstruction of the injectrode, micro, uh, the injectrode as well, and what you can see in the close-up in the right of it forming within the foramen. So the question becomes, does it work functionally the same as a standard DRG lead? So this is great work done by Doug Weber and Lee Fisher and Ashley Darlimple and Jordan Ting, um, both as a collaboration with Pitt and with uh, Carnegie Mellon. And in this prep, which is a cat prep, they injected the injectrode in the DRG and then directly compared its uh, effect in activating a different fiber types by recording at the sciatic nerve and other distal nerves. Here's the recording prep where they compare the stainless steel and injectrode at different um, spinal levels, and then they do the recording at the sciatic nerve, the tibial nerve, and the perineal nerve uh, with uh, epineural multi-contact uh, cuff electrodes. This is just a general example of the uh, evoke compound action potentials as a function of stimulation and how they are, there's a graded response, which you see in the lower left-hand uh, corner as a function of uh, turning up the, the current that's applied. Uh, this paper, and actually all of the material that I've uh, presented, is about to come up 
in papers if it's not published already. And so what the, their labs found is that the injectrode has a very similar threshold in terms of activating A betas and other uh, components such as A deltas uh, as the stainless steel mimic of the traditional DRG leads. Um, on the left, you'll see direct comparisons at different pulses of the stainless steel versus the injectrode. Um, but what was really interesting is given that the injectrode has a much greater geometric area, it was actually activating um, at a much lower charge density. So roughly one third to one fourth the charge density for threshold of these traditional leads, which actually could save you a lot of power and extend your battery life. So in our original paper, uh, we had done silver electrodes, which we knew were toxic. We had then mo moved to gold and or platinum versions of the injectorid material and done long-term biocompatibility studies consistent with ISO 10993. This is great work done by the Schofstel lab. And what you're seeing here is actually the response. Uh, so for ISO 10993, you inject it right under the skin. This is removing the skin and not actually pulling off any of the scarring that formed or anything like that. And what you see is actually revascularization through the injector in a very minimal scar. This is roughly the same way of showing you the same thing. This is a section through um, and over, uh, this is 120 days out. Um, and what you'll see is actually, again, uh, 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 red blood cells and revascularization through the matrix as you see these, these gold particles in a very thin fibrous capsule. So this is what you traditionally do if you're going to humans. Uh, you have an independent histopathologist rated over a large number of animals, um, where five is the most severe response and zero is the least severe response. And what you'll see is um, it peters out after about eight weeks and we get between one to two, which is very typical for an implanted uh, device material. In fact, a lot of the stuff that I worked with clinically uh, before in industry would be between a two, or two and a three. And it's a four and a five that you start getting worried. So in more work with the Lemka lab and Bobby Graham and then Nishant Verma, who's from my lab, we've created a modeling system for this unique injectrode concept with collector under the skin. And we're actually not just modeling the deep nerve and the connection to it, we're modeling the activation of cutaneous fibers that would be responsible for your side effect, um, A betas and A deltas that might be associated with pain. And what we see with these models in C is the comparison of a TENS unit trying to stimulate a deep nerve versus the TENS unit with the injectrode connecting uh, just under the skin to the deep nerve. And what you'll see is the injectrode actually, uh, the activation threshold for A betas at the deep nerve um, are roughly one to two orders of magnitude smaller than with the TENS unit alone. And we're working with different configurations because one of the issues uh, with non-invasive stimulation is often you want a subject to be able to do this at home. So we're using this modeling structure to figure out what is the most tolerant to different placements of the TENS unit over the collector to get efficiency of current transfer to the deep nerve. Now this is data over a large animal cohort um, just showing a similar uh, vagus nerve stimulation with this collector concept. And what we've seen is that um, we can actually route from the chest as opposed to the neck and stimulate the vagus with a TENS unit um, that cost, uh, cost us $50 uh, from Amazon um, and stimulate the collector and then have the current go to the vagus and create a heart rate response. And what you'll see in the left is the heart rate response when we stimulate with the collector system. If we just move the, remove that collector under the skin, um, but leave the wire and the injector on the deep vagus, we get no response. So in addition to the collaborators that I've already mentioned, um, this is very complicated work um, and there's several people that I'd like to thank. First of all, James Trevathan um, has been the postdoctoral uh, fellow in my lab who's been really leading all of this work on the injectrode. Um, Bruce Knutson and Megan Sattel and Steph Blantz and Maria Lalazern are people within my lab that have been very important to the execution of these studies. Um, Justin Williams and Aaron Siminski and Sarah Brodnick were very important for the conceptualization of these studies. Um, the initial injectrode work was actually funded under the DARPA TNT program um, for vagus nerve stimulation before it was adapted to stimulation of the DRG um, for the NIH HEAL program. So that being said, this is all earlier stage data 
the publications are forthcoming, and we know we have a lot of work to do before we show long-term chronic viability um, for the treatment of pain. Um, but we look forward to sharing that data in the future. Uh, most importantly, I'm happy to answer any of your questions going forward. Although this is pre-recorded, I should now hopefully appear live, potentially in different clothing, to answer your questions. Presto, you're live. Thank you very much for an excellent presentation, Kip. And um, we have three questions. I'm not sure if we can get to them all. I think How does I, the inject rode stay intact over time? A broken electrode could cause increased current density at the site of delivery. Hubert just noticed I'm wearing very similar uh, clothing. They're very similar. Oh, I only have one outfit. Yeah. Sorry, I've, I've, I've been traveling due to a, a passing of a family member, actually. So uh, that is also why that video was recorded, because I didn't know where I would be. Um, so all of these, a lot of these questions are, are very similar. Um, and so I'm going to combine them really uh, quickly. Okay. Um, we have not done, we've done long-term biocompatibility testing. That's not the same as doing long-term STEM for efficacy and showing that you can keep a consistent route uh, from uh, the skin to the, to the deep nerve. Uh, my expectation, honestly, is that we will have to uh, adjust the formulations to address some of these issues. You know, we're very aware. Uh, what's really interesting is actually cochlear prosthetics. It's only the platinum salts that are toxic. They regularly have little chunks of platinum that come off, and that's not a problem. Um, they essentially just get engulfed in macrophages. But we're doing a lot of work on the fundamental biochemistry of these novel electrode formulations to understand what might create toxicity, what might... Um, what stimulation we can do. We have some belief though that it's a buffered system. Um, essentially you will get shunting between TENS unit patches. And if you use up the capacitive mechanism of charge transfer of the injectrode, the faradaic mechanism that causes toxic salts um, becomes a, a higher impedance pathway. And you actually just get more shunting between the TENS unit patches as opposed to more current going through the injectrode. Um, so that's something that we need to prove, but it's at least in theory what we think will happen here. Um, as for the long-term um, stretch testing um, and anchoring in place and all those sorts of things, our hope is because it conforms to the nerve in a unique way that these modified DVS leads don't for DRG stem, that it will have less migration issues, but that's less yet to be proven. Um, it can flex to over uh, twice its size um, and have multiple, we're, we're essentially starting to implement the standard industry, you know, million flex tests to see how long it survives. Um, and we're currently doing those and we will see if we have to reformulate or not based off of how well it does for those things. Um, there's more questions coming in. Yeah, there's two more. Yeah. One of them was after you answered that question. Yeah. Um, so the one is, is there any risk with charge being injected through the skin conductor parasitically, uh, e.g. ESD? Um, I'm not sure I quite understand this question, to be honest with you. Um, so uh, send me an email at kip.ludwig at wisconsin.edu, and um, I'm happy to follow up. Um, as for the, uh, the other one, Andrew Whalen, this is a great question. Is the material substrate of the injector porous allowing the higher char uh, charge delivery surface area or just the conformity of the substrate to the body gives you the higher effective charge delivery? So it is porous and that's why it has a much greater electrochemical surface area. Ions aren't just interfacing on the surface of the electrode, they're permeating through the matrix and getting the entirety of that. That is one reason in which we believe it, it, it has an advantage, but also the modeling's doesn't include that. It suggests just the conformity, not having a single ring above the DRG that activates focally. And instead of having it form in the foramen and essentially be closer to all the A betas, um, also appears to lower the charge density, but that needs to be proven in chronic experiments for both of these things. Honestly, scarring in could change both of those properties fairly dra dramatically. Great, thanks, Kip. Excellent, and you're right on time. Thank you so much. Indeed. So uh, next up, um, it is my great honor to welcome Professor Lawrence Poire of the Department of Anesthesia and Perioperative Care at the University of California, San Francisco, where he is the director of the Neuromodulation Service of the Pain Management Center. He is now a leading authority in the clinical application of neuromodulation strategies for the treatment of chronic pain. Um, he serves on the uh, North American Mod Neuromodulation Society Board of Directors, 
and he also serves on the board of the California Society of Interventional Pain Physicians and the International Neuromodulation Board of Directors. Welcome, Dr. Poiré, and thank you very much for taking the time today to spend with us. Well, thank you very much for the um, invitation. This has been a very exciting uh, meeting so far. I've learned a lot and uh, really appreciate the patient's perspectives as well. I'll uh, start sharing my screen here in just a second to bring up my presentation. Now, the title of my talk today is ECAP Control Closed Loop Spinal Cord Stimulation, The Dawn of a New Era. And uh, I'll explain why I believe that's to be the case. I do have some um, consulting arrangements uh, with Medtronic, Nalu, and Saluda, and Stock Optimus with uh, a couple of those as well. So when we talk about spinal cord stimulation uh, clinically, we have to be um, cognizant of the fact that recent publications and uh, experiences over the last several decades have shown that we do well, we get good uh, positive um, uh, feedback and success rates uh, with our patients in the clinic. But over the course of time, we're really facing an um, uh, inordinate amount of loss of efficacy. Uh, we have a Pope study reported up to 43% at uh, five years. And this has been uh, described by multiple other uh, investigators that in the two to five year period, you can get as much as a 20 to 40% loss of efficacy leading to explantation. And this is a real problem and one that uh, we all continue to struggle with. Now, the, the issue is why do we have this problem? And in my own opinion, I think it's because we have uh, a variety of systems that have uh, developed over the last uh, 20 to 30 years that provide a lot of different types of stimuli, but none of these systems actually characterize what's happening on the individual patients, their own physiology. And I think that's the key that will hopefully make a difference for the future uh, uh, stimulators to come. Uh, this is not just a problem with spinal cord stimulation. This is a problem with a variety of uh, medical devices. And this uh, uh, article by the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers characterizes um, the idea of using physiological closed loop control to modulate a variety of our medical devices. Overall, that means that most of the systems we have in place, both spinal cord stem and uh, other medical devices, use the clinician or the patient uh, to evaluate the efficacy of their therapy and then manually make the adjustments to the output, be that a ventil ventil um, um, uh, tidal volume on a respirator, uh, the amount of anesthetic that's given during anesthesia. Uh, and so it's fraught with uh, delay and difficulty. Uh, when we look at a closed loop system, we look at an algorithm, a computer uh, controlled algorithm that evaluates on a signal, a physiological signal that is determined by the clinician and the patient together. And then that algorithm is implemented so that the types of changes that need to be made are made quickly and efficiently and um, uh, provide better overall control. The types of devices that are out there currently that are doing this include um, uh, the insulin pumps, uh, which monitor blood glucose and adjust the amount of insulin. Uh, we have anesthesia machines now that use EEG recordings to uh, uh, control how much uh, anesthetic, uh, be it propofol or remifentanil, are delivered, and respirators uh, in the ICU are currently looking at CO2 monitoring uh, to change ventilation rates. So uh, the FDA had a recent um, workshop discussing uh, these types of devices. And they uh, defined a physiological uh, closed loop control device as a device that incorporates physiological sensors for automatic manipulation of a physiological variable through actuation uh, therapy that is conventionally made by a clinician. Their hypothesis was that these types of devices have the potential to re reduce the workload of, um, of the clinicians and automatically deliver um, accurate and um, effective therapy to patients. So when we're looking at spinal cord stimulation, how will this uh, uh, concept be uh, implemented? How can we sort of utilize this? We heard by earlier talks, the uh, Melzack and wall gate control theory, uh, whereby stimulation of a low threshold mechanical receptor, a beta fiber, uh, can cause activation of inner neurons that then inhibit uh, the white dynamic range neurons that then project um, cephalad. Uh, what we try to avoid is activation of the nociceptor A del delta fibers and the C fibers. And we, when we apply electricity to the epidural space, 
um, that electricity is going to all of the above uh, fibers. Holzheimer in 2003 characterized um, uh, this issue and uh, postulated that we could separate the stimulation of the large fibers from the small fibers by looking at the uh, uh, minimum currents needed to activate and in the lower range of stimulation could actively uh, uh, stimulate, uh, prioritize the larger uh, fibers that contribute to analgesia versus uh, the smaller fibers that contributed to pain. But you can see here on this uh, strength duration curve that that range is a very narrow range uh, to separate these two. And it's critically important to maintain um, accuracy. We heard a lot about the dosing of uh, TENS units earlier today, and uh, that's consistent throughout an entire spectrum of neuromodulation. The problem with the current concept is that we have the leads here providing electrical stimulation in a rather static fashion right over the uh, uh, posterior aspect of the spinal cord, which would then activate those fibers that are interested to us. This and, um, assumes that there is no other variables and that the only variable is the variable that is uh, provided by the device. And in fact, that just isn't the case. Um, when we look at a dose of um, output from a device and we talk about the dosing of um, stimulation, that dosing implies that what is left from the, what sort of leaves the device actually gets to the spinal cord. And in real physiology and the real patients, this just doesn't seem to be an accurate representation. Instead, we have this descriptor here with a little diagram and cartoon here that shows that there's tremendous amount of motion. We heard from our patient earlier that simple coughing caused extra stimulation, extra twisting caused extra stimulation. And we can see why that distance between the spinal cord and the electrodes is constantly moving and constantly being um, uh, altered by things like uh, coughing, breathing, standing, sitting. Um, and so when we talk about dose, especially for spinal cord stimulation, uh, I think more so than with um, peripheral nerve stimulation where your leads are in greater uh, proximity to your uh, target, uh, here the output of the device does not necessarily uh, guarantee that you know what is being delivered and um, received by the spinal cord itself. So how can we uh, sort of utilize a physiological control mechanism to control the device? Uh, one way to do that is to look at the uh, evoked compound action potential, uh, just the external recording of um, a compound action potential evoked by the stimulation itself. And the challenge with that from an engineering standpoint, of course, is that the stimulus is uh, very large and the artifact is very large and the ECAP signal that you're trying to record, the neural response from the spinal cord itself, is on um, uh, the order of six orders of magnitude smaller than the stimulus. So filtering and processing the signal is quite the challenge. And it's probably why we haven't had seen this in the last 50 years of spinal cord stimulation. Um, a recent uh, paper by uh, Dr. Parker and uh, colleagues uh, examined how to use a spinal cord stimulator lead and record from all the other contacts except for the two contacts being used to uh, elicit the action potential. And you can see here that um, uh, with the processing, they were able to uh, characterize a, a compound action potential in a patient with a um, uh, epidural lead. This device has now been uh, commercialized in Europe and in Australia. Is still in FDA evaluation here in the United States. This device can stimulate um, on a 12 contact lead, that is two leads placed, and all the leads except for the two that are used for stimulation can be used to record and characterize the ECAP that is most consistent with the analgesia uh, that the patient reports. Just like with all other spinal cord stimulating systems, um, it's important to understand uh, where the target zone is. And so just like any other system where the patient comes in and um, uh, for those that are uh, uh, lower frequency, they can be asked when they feel it, 
what are the ranges that are providing good analgesic benefit, and then increase to those areas that are overstimulation and cause uh, intolerance and discomfort. And then the patient is programmed to provide the ideal settings for their uh, uh, stimulation to provide them the greatest benefit for analgesia. And by measuring their own individual neurophysiology, we can see that there's huge variability from patient to patient, as one might expect, but uh, up until this point for the last 50 years, we've been unable to do this and, and didn't know how much variability there was, even with a constant output. We can see here that at about 300, uh, 3.5 uh, uh, milliamps, uh, two different patients have uh, very different uh, ECAP responses, and yet they're both in the therapeutic range. But if you increase uh, by 20 or 30% on subject B there, you have very little change in the spinal cord activation, whereas in subject A, that would potentially get you into a much higher range and uh, overstimulation paradigm. And within a given patient, the same thing. We have devices that can tell uh, positioning of the device uh, and adjust accordingly. But here we can see with a, um, a uh, patient that is uh, standing and sitting, the device and the spine are both upright. And yet just by going from the sitting position to the standing position, there is an increase of uh, a stimulation due to the uh, narrowing of the CSF. Likewise, uh, if you go from a standing position to a supine position, you can go from being uh, understimulated at two and a half milliamps to being overstimulated in that supine position. These are the variabilities that occur every day with every patient. And we heard earlier today from our patients talking about not only coughing, but different settings when they lie down. And therefore, um, having to make alterations throughout the day. Uh, one of the most uh, impressive um, uh, stories I recall was a patient who had recently uh, immigrated from uh, England. And she and her husband were not quite used to driving on the other side of the road. And she stated that her husband always took right hand turns a little too quickly, creating more centrifugal force. And every time he took a right hand turn, she got a shock. Uh, so for her, she had to turn her device off while she drove with her husband. So when we're looking at that therapeutic range, it's critically important to really focus in on where we want the activations to be, uh, the A, beta, uh, low threshold mechanical receptors, and understand that it doesn't take too much more energy to get them to activate the A, beta nociceptors and even some of the A, delta receptors by doing simple things like standing and coughing. We see here in a recording of uh, uh, ECAPs for this patient, uh, huge variability that we've seen five, 10 times greater with these simple maneuvers. Uh, deep breathing, coughing, walking, standing. Uh, the small little wiggles that you see are actually representations of uh, cardiac changes in the larger swings, some of the respiratory changes. But clearly this is a real problem and a real issue with every device that's commercially available today. When you look at this particular individual who was programmed uh, with uh, ECAP, so using physiological uh, measurements to actually uh, program his device, which is um, the first time um, this has ever been done. Uh, he had an ideal set point when he was in the clinic in the chair getting programmed, just like we do for all of our patients in the PACU or in the recovery room or in the clinic. We have a setting that we set for them that we believe is the ideal setting. And then we have them go home. In this particular case, this individual went home for nine days. Uh, the device was recording that entire time, all of the stimulations that were being uh, delivered. And because of this, see here on the right side, the overstimulation, 1% of the time, he was being overstimulated, causing discomfort. And as a result, uh, the patient decided to turn the device down so as not to be overstimulated. So in this quest not to be overstimulated, he actually ended up being understimulated 83% of the time and can only stay within the therapeutic range 16% of the time. That gets us back to this closed loop uh, scenario we talked about earlier in the IEEE paper. Um, we needed a mechanism that can actually understand the setting, understand the physiological variable, and then maintain that uh, in spite of um, uh, the changes that might happen to the body because the patients just can't maintain that narrow window. 
with this particular device. The device is uh, identified as uh, and set to a setting for delivering an ECAP in the clinic. And that ECAP correlates with the pain control of the patient reports. And then that is what is set, not the output of the device, but the neurological response that the patient's receiving um, real time. Each individual pulse, be it you're stimulating it, 10 hertz, 50 hertz, or 100 hertz. Each individual pulse is compared to the pulse previously and um, compared to the target pulse. And an adjustment is made for each of the subsequent pulses. Is that too low or too high? And do we need to sort of change the activity or the amplitude of what's delivered? What that, hap what that results in is approximately um, several million uh, changes per day uh, to maintain that optimum window of stimulation. And I'm not sure, I, let me just, I'm gonna stop sharing the screen just for a second to make sure the audio is on. Sorry, I forgot to check that earlier. Yeah, it is on, great. So I wanted to show this because this is a patient with a device. And I want you to keep your eyes on two traces here. Uh, the upper trace is the ECAP trace or the uh, evoked compound actual potential traces and the lower trace is the output of the device, the sort of the milliamps from the output of the device. And in open loop, just like with every other system that's commercially available, there's a static setting and that setting doesn't change. And let's hear how she experiences that. Try the little cough, small one. <coughs> Did you feel anything then? The, the spike of intensity. Yeah. You want to try a bigger cough? Yes. <laughs> That'll be a bigger spike. <coughs> Yes. Oh, yes. So you can see there the increases in the ECAPs getting her to the point where she's overstimulated with laughing and coughing and things of that nature. Uh, now let's all that has changed in the next setting here is try the little cough. Small. Okay, let's try the coughs again. <coughs> Bigger cough. <coughs> Feel any changes there? Not much of a change, no. So you can see here when it's put in the closed loop mode, huge decreases in the output of the device, uh, responsive to the increased intrathoracic pressure, which increases the or decreases the distance between the lead and the spinal cord. And it can make these changes so rapidly that she doesn't feel uh, any change in, uh, in stimulation and doesn't cause any excess uh, neural stimulation. So let's get back to our gentleman who for nine days was uh, rarely in his therapeutic window. Uh, when he came back in, the device was set to the closed loop setting. He overstimulated only 0.01% of the time. Therefore, he could tolerate stimulation at therapeutic range without risking overstimulation 93% of the time and was only um, understimulated 7%. So this device was first um, utilized in a uh, uh, multi-site uh, center trial. There was an open label trial in Australia. The 12 month was uh, data was published in, in neurosurgery uh, last year. And the 24 month data was just accepted for publication in, in pending medicine last month. Uh, this was uh, 50 patients over uh, one of these five sites. And what we see here is that the three month, 12 month, 18, 24 months, uh, we saw a 80% uh, response rate of those patients receiving greater than 50% pain relief. However, what was most interesting was that the high responder rate, those that were receiving over 80% benefit, uh, started off at 42% uh, of the patients at, uh, at three months, but uh, steadily increased over time. And this is uh, thought to be because the devices were being uh, fine-tuned to the individual's uh, ECAPs and uh, feedback mechanisms so that patients were getting better and better control over the course of time. When we look at the Oswestry Disability Index, 82% uh, of the patients were in the severe to crippling disability range. Only 18% were in the mild range at baseline. And at the end of 24 months, those numbers were basically flipped with 76% in the mild to moderate and only 24% in the severe disability or crippling. Opiate reduction was also noted over the course of those two years, also increasing over time. And at 24 months, 82% of the patients either reduced or eliminated their uh, opioid medications, 
uh, completely eliminate opioid usage. So that was a great uh, open label study, but of course it wasn't uh, controlled. And so then um, the uh, uh, Evoke study was elicited, uh, started uh, several years ago, and this was um, a multi-center uh, study. It was a double-blinded study. Uh, the study is uh, scheduled to go for three years. The 12-month data has been published um, uh, last year. The 24-month data has uh, been recently submitted for publication, so I won't be presenting that until it is submitted. And the 36-month uh, data, which I'm uh, eagerly uh, awaiting and hope to see at the next NANS meeting in January of 2022, uh, will be interesting because at the two-year mark, patients are allowed to electively cross over to the other arm. Uh, throughout this entire time, both the patients and the physicians have remained blinded to which loop, uh, arm of the study they're in. Uh, the uh, baseline of pain for these patients is rather high at uh, eight, 80 millimeters on a 100 millimeter scale. All had back and leg pain uh, for over 11 years and all were uh, severely disabled by the Oswestry Disability Index. All programming was Id identical. Uh, the procedure was identical. Um, the lead location, the uh, electrical characteristics, the real base of chronicity were identical uh, throughout the entire uh, uh, process and the study. There was no difference between these two groups whatsoever. At the, in the uh, recovery room, um, uh, a uh, independent uh, member of the team um, was able to open the envelope and decide which of the arms the patient would be in and program either open or closed loop. But like I said before, the physician and patients were not allowed to, to see that. Now let's look at the actual ECAP responses. Here you can see in the left side of this uh, graph, this is the closed loop section, where by a three months, uh, the average target uh, response of the ECAP was 37 uh, microvolts. And in 12 months, 27 microvolts and not much difference. And let's look at the orange versus the green. The green was the target level set and the orange was the out of clinic uh, response. And you can see here that in the closed loop group, what was set in the clinic was virtually maintained throughout the entire study. No real difference between the two. Whereas on the right here, the open labeled uh, open loop group, uh, in spite of having the exact same settings in the clinic, uh, immediately thereafter, patients would reduce it so as not to uh, experience the overstimulation. And on average, you can see they're almost an order of magnitude less in their ability to activate the spinal cord. Same happens at 12 months and we see a narrowing of the therapeutic window, um, which has brought up a, a variety of other interesting concepts about why we might see long-term failure and uh, lack of uh, long-term efficacy in spinal cord stimulation patients when they have um, uh, episodes of overstimulation and um, those aspects are still being investigated. So 95% uh, of uh, the time, the patients in the open label group were able to maintain the, the realm of their therapeutic window as set in the clinic. 0% uh, of the time were they overstimulated and less than 2% of the time did they have understimulation. Whereas in the open label group here on the right, you see it's almost 50-50. Uh, half the time they were able to maintain the therapeutic window, but the other half the time they were not because probably of this 0.3% of the time, they were being overstimulated. Because the, this is the first time uh, spinal cord stimulation trial has been done utilizing the patient's own electrophysiology for programming. Um, so this, even the open label group uh, did fairly well. This is just as well as you would have seen and maybe actually a little bit better than we would have seen it with other um, more conventional stimulators, but they did very, very well. Um, but you can see that when they had the closed loop component uh, engaged, um, their stability and efficacy was improved and uh, stability was uh, uh, stable over the course of 12 months. And I'll give you a little preview to let you know that the two-year data looks a lot like this. And so uh, look forward to that coming out in press uh, relatively soon. When we look at the overall um, uh, responder rates in this uh, tornado graph, we see that um, uh, 
instead of the old adage that 50% of the people get 50% benefit, which is what we typically would report for our more traditional stimulators. Here we see that 80% um, uh, of the uh, test subjects uh, got at least 50% benefit and 50 to 60% uh, or 50% got 80% benefit. So we're starting to really um, uh, improve on the long-term efficacy of spinal cord stimulation. Certainly as a clinician, I'm more interested in 90% of the patients getting 90% benefit, but at least uh, understanding the physiology of my individual patients will help me then identify what changes and alterations in their stimulation parameters I can uh, engage in order to help them uh, receive greater benefit. On this uh, study, we also found uh, uh, the uh, high responder rate, uh, once again, was at 56%, uh, uh, significantly greater than in the open loop. Uh, one of the uh, measures that I uh, think was most significant from a clinical perspective is the improvement in sleep characteristics. Here, this using, utilizing the uh, Pittsburgh sleep uh, questionnaire, we found that uh, uh, at baseline, only 3% of the patients were getting a good sleep at baseline. And at the end of the study, you can see here in the closed loop group, uh, with an increase in the Pittsburgh sleep questionnaire uh, by 5.7 points. Anything over three points is considered to be clinically significant. Um, we got up to 30% of the patients getting good sleep patterns. Um, open loop uh, group did uh, well, but not as well as a closed loop group. And um, um, prior to this study, uh, the best that had been reported in the literature uh, was a CENSA study, which uh, reported a 2.6 in their experimental group. Once again, the Oswestry Disability uh, Index improved by 51% uh, in the closed loop. I uh, did very well in the open loop as well. And once again, uh, better than some of the things we've seen in the literature recently. Reduction of opiates was also monitored. And here, once again, we see almost 55% of the patients uh, able to reduce or eliminate their opioids as compared to only 40% in the open loop. And uh, once again, uh, 35 in the uh, CENSA study. Profile of uh, mood uh, scale was 61% uh, uh, versus 33% in the open loop, uh, statistically significantly different there as well. And the patient global impression of change, also um, high for actually both groups, did very well because patients were getting good pain relief, but able to control that output even better, uh, resulted in even better output and uh, patient's impressions in the closed loop group. Now, these studies cannot be directly compared because they are um, not done at the same time and a variety of other uh, differences. But just for uh, general um, uh, information and understanding, we have uh, the Abbott Burst study, the Boston Science Scientific Broco study, the Nevrosenza one year and uh, 24 month data. And you can see how um, the closed loop uh, studies, both the Evoke and the Avalon, uh, compare with these and taking patients who have much higher ratings of pain uh, initially and reducing them uh, significantly so down to uh, levels that are uh, considered to be uh, uh, extremely effective for long-term chronic pain management. So when we look at um, this new technology, does ECAP controlled closed loop spinal cord stimulation uh, seem to be a physiological closed loop controlled medical device? I think it is because it does deliver accurate, consistent, real-time uh, spinal cord stimulation and provides uh, better uh, outcomes for patients. Now, this is one uh, mechanism. I think it is the uh, sort of the immediate future uh, technology for uh, spinal cord stimulation. I'm sure that uh, things will develop over time. Uh, in the distant future, I expect that some work uh, I and a colleague are working at UCSF looking at how spinal cord stimulation um, impacts the EEG signals, and maybe we can find a physiological marker there to provide some feedback as well. This is in its very early stages. Uh, we have uh, sort of evaluated uh, uh, this on eight uh, patients so far, and at the uh, Neural Interface Conference uh, slash NANS meeting uh, in uh, later this summer, uh, some of that data will be presented. So in conclusion, we now have at least some insights to why we see huge, such huge variability and inconsistency in long-term therapy. And we can, uh, for the first time, actually measure an individual's 
physiology that's responsive to uh, spinal cord stimulation. This is something we haven't been able to do before, and I think will provide us the opportunity to actually start utilizing human physiology, patients' own physiology, to make rational decisions about what we do with our stimulator output devices and um, go beyond just what I'm currently doing, which is just saying, how are you doing today? And my options are we can go up, we can go down, or we can turn the device off when patients aren't doing well. i much rather have a, a, a physiological marker that I can correlate to uh, efficacy and make the adjustments as need be. With that, I'll stop and uh, take questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Puri. Is it Larry or Lawrence? I go by Lawrence. Lawrence, okay. Um, so we have several questions. Can you see those by chance? I can read them, uh, if not. I, uh, let me check on the chat here. How is the lower limit of a therapeutic window determined? Ah, great question. Uh, so uh, in the clinical setting, um, uh, the threshold is determined by increasing the amplitude and asking the patients when they first feel it, um, then increasing it more to feel um, uh, that they can feel benefit. Uh, and then the device is turned high enough so they find the level at which they cannot tolerate one minute of that stimulation. That's called the overstimulation. And then reduced again back down until they say it's in a range that they feel comfortable in. And so then that lower range of the overstimulation and the, um, uh, the upper range of where they feel like they're getting good stimulation, that's the window uh, of the um, therapeutic window. And typically we end up selecting the lower end of that just to sort of minimize overstimulation again. Okay, um, for the ECAP SC, one last question I think we'll do. Uh, for the ECAP SCS, is it primarily a, in traditional paresthesia uh, SCS, or is it also applied to high frequency burst SCS? Right. And so, since um, we are looking at ECAPs, ECAPs are action potentials. Uh, this is applied to devices that are actually generating an action potential. Um, we talked about the gate control theory earlier, and those utilize human um, uh, neural signals, or that's utilizing normal physiology. High frequency does not, uh, neurons don't respond at that rate, so you can't get an ECAP of something that's uh, super high frequency uh, because neural uh, tissue doesn't respond at that 10,000 kilohertz. But within the range of, uh, uh, let's say, four hertz that we talked about at... Uh, uh, the um, tens units all the way up to 100 hertz, we can generate ECAPs and it can be utilized as long as there are neural responses. So in that full okay. range. There is one other anonymous uh, question that you might look at in the Q&A um, after the fact, but I think we should wrap it up so that we have at least a, a five minute break here. Well, it's going to be a six minute break. Uh, we should return for the next session at uh, 2.40 Central Time. Okay. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Pore. That was fantastic. Thank you. Okay, we'll see everybody at 2.40 uh, for their second session. And I see the list of attendees and uh, I just see so many friends and students and uh, so excited to have you all here. Um, it's been well attended. We have uh, had 130 people attending for the first uh, two sessions. So um, please uh, come back for the second session. It's going to be fantastic on spinal cord injury.